less than 48 hours ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of American life as the sound of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from outer space, a radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Union's Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passes over New York earlier this evening. This is now the satellite which surrounds all of us. In the competition for leadership in space, where is the finish line? In the Cold War, it's pretty clear who shot a nuclear missile at you. You can see it. But in today's world, it's pretty unclear who just launched the cyber attack against you. People have always been robbing banks. People have always been embezzling money. People have always been lying and cheating. And the internet just gives people another avenue to lie and cheat and steal. The nation's largest credit rating bureau may have been the target of a hack attack by amateur computer wizard. TRW's Information Services Division has computer records on 90 million Americans, 85% of the breadwinners in this country. They look at data as ones and zeros that should be liberated and are free for everybody, and they don't see the boundaries that we all have. Privacy is one of those things that you don't really notice it until it's gone. We're entering in a world where all data is now saved. And this is the end of prehistory. Now, your kids are going to have everything saved. And that's a real different world. Good evening, America. It troubles me to tell you that your personal and private information is in the hands of thousands of people who you never met and will never know. The stereotype is it's the kid who didn't have a girlfriend, right? And so he's spending all of his time down there in the basement, right? Um, there was something to that. There's sometimes stereotypes at the core of the stereotype. There's a little bit of truth. So we had all of these, uh, you know, kids who were bored and they were exploring. And you started to see this phenomenon where the anonymity of the network let people feel entitled to do things that they probably wouldn't do otherwise. The physical morphology of the hacker is something that I think that people have made a lot of jokes about and I don't think that the stereotype is necessarily wrong. That it's somebody with a black t-shirt, drinking a jolt cola, with a kind of pale complexion because they haven't been out that much and they sleep all day and they're up all night. But if you go to hacker conferences like I do, um, while that description may fit a majority of the people at the conference, they're still ample other types of people who are interested in computers and computer security. Sometimes hackers mean computer criminals. I'm using hackers in the term, the old Stephen Levy sense of hackers are explorers. Um, just like you have criminal plumbers and non-criminal plumbers, you have criminal hackers and non-criminal hackers. The media loves to jump on the stereotype of a hacker as some little teenager in his basement who's working at midnight on his little computer and breaking into the Pentagon and launching ICBMs at Russia. I mean, that's Hollywood, that's, it makes a good story, but that is not true. A hacker basically is somebody, they're not necessarily malicious, they're just curious. I first heard the term hacker in the 80s, and it was in reference to someone hacking their way through something. In other words, someone learning something um, that was difficult in context of computer programming, it, you were just cobbling it together to get it to work. You weren't making it beautiful, you weren't doing it necessarily right, you were hacking it together. Basically what you're seeing here is a uh, modern day hacker space. Uh, you'll find things not just about computers, you'll find people doing sewing, lock picking, uh, computer hacking, cybersecurity, physics, chemistry, a whole bunch of stuff. A hacker is a person who pushes the boundaries of their form and art. And basically you find people here that are polymaths, like people that actually do multiple things and they're jack of all trades, master of none, but more often better than a master of one. The first time I ever heard the term hacker, I was a teenager. I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they had just apprehended Kevin Mitnick. So, you know, I grew up associating computer hacker with computer criminal. My early impressions of the word before I really could have lived any of it were just um, someone who had the power to 
work with computers in a way that was kind of like magic. So they were basically wizards of the computer world. Mathematician Claude E. Shannon of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology designed this electronic maze not to prove any special point, but mostly for fun. The movable walls of the maze can be arranged to make millions of different patterns through which the artificial mouse must travel to reach its goal. To find its way through the pattern, the mouse proceeds as we would by trial and error. The Pentagon was accused today of not paying enough attention to the security of its computer system. Earlier this year, a network of foreign computer hackers broke the code of a number of Defense Department computers, giving them access to information on American weapons. We're going to use this modified phone to attack and take over a Windows computer. A white hat hacker is doing hacking for a, a good purpose. Um, sometimes they're hired to go in and do what's called a penetration test of a company and expose any vulnerabilities and report that back. Uh, other times they're doing research that can benefit the internet community. On the other end of the spectrum is black hat hacking, which is malicious and it tends to benefit the individual or sometimes it's for profit of an organization or it can be a political expression. Did you ever come comfortable with the idea of actually serving a little time for what you were doing? Because no. You, no. I don't but want you, still, to... you still kept doing it. Oh yeah, of course. It's an addiction. It's completely an addiction. So the prospect of jail wasn't enough to stop you? Oh. Don't have too much time to think about that, actually. I think part of it is the obsession. It's the obsession of, I have to make this work. It's kind of like a chess game. I have to win. And it's not like playing, you know, tic-tac-toe. Nobody ever wins, right? When you play chess, it's very strategic. Attacking computer systems is also very strategic, and it can take days and weeks to physically get what you want. So you have to target it out and figure out where the weak point is. How do I move there to get over there under that system? It literally, I mean, I can't even tell you how long I've stayed up in periods of, like, time to, like, hit a system that I wanted. I think when I was younger, I just didn't care if I got caught. I mean, I still worked really hard not to leave any traces. The ramifications were just never more intimidating than the thrill of doing a righteous hack. And it, it was always really exciting. And any hack that I spent a considerable amount of time on, I had to have some kind of reason that I really cared about that data. If someone tries to, to keep some data closed and it's not it's not some ethical rule that's stopping you, it's just their made up rule and their attempt at secure technology, then it's, it's almost a moral imperative to take that data. The question really is, is the law right? Do we need that particular law? So even though there's a law that says you can't do something, hackers are really questioning should it even exist? For most people that I consider to be hackers, the innovators or experimenters, it is a desire to know and a desire to learn, often coupled with a slightly antisocial belief that the man has been lying to you and that what they're telling you isn't all there is to life. Um, you know, I think always about the, the Matrix movie, which I think of as one of the, you know, quintessential hacker movies um, where there's so much more going on under the surface and you can choose to blind yourself to it or you can choose to know. And the hacker is always, you know, going to choose to know. October 1957, the United States was losing the Cold War. Russia announcing she had shot a man-made moon 560 miles into space, where it was circling the Earth at the dizzy speed of 18,000 miles per hour. The launching of Sputnik and what happened uh, subsequent to that radically changed the American attitudes towards their own personal safety or the safety of this country. When it was reported, it shocked the American people absolutely beyond belief. For them to pull off this feat, sending the first satellite into space, 
created a, a kind of atmosphere of questioning as to what we were, where we were going. And Americans had always prided themselves on being by far the advanced technological culture of the world. So there were really two shocks in a sense, a culture shock, namely how could these backward peoples have produced something that we were incapable of doing, but also a shock in terms of our own national safety because if they could put a, a satellite into orbit, into space, surely they could hit any American city uh, that they chose to. As a primary deterrent to war, maintain a strong nuclear retaliatory power. The Soviets must be convinced that any attack on us and our allies would result, regardless of damage to us, in their own national destruction. Now we were part of a globe in which no one was protected by physical barriers. In a purely strategic sense, it meant we had to advance so much that we would have an unassailable advantage over the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union now has, in the combined category, category of scientists and engineers, a greater number than the United States. And it is producing graduates in these fields at a much faster rate. And the result was the National Defense Education Act which called for spending billions of dollars into the sciences, into engineering. So it seemed to be that we were moving into a world that was totally unfamiliar to us. A world, again, of computers and, and of missiles and, of, uh, and that sort of thing. Just very confusing period for Americans. Indeed, according to my scientific advisors, this is for the American people the most critical problem of all. Let me begin by taking you back into time to the origins of the Internet. Before there was an Internet, the Advanced Research Projects Agency in the Defense Department started a project that they called the ARPANET to try out this idea called packet switching, which is a very distinct way of switching data around than the traditional telephone system, which uses what's called circuit switching. So we built a four-node network and I was lucky enough to be a graduate student at UCLA at the time. And I wrote the software that connected this Sigma 7 computer to the first packet switch of the ARPANET that was installed at UCLA in September of 1969. And by December, we had four nodes up and running. And then by landline, across the United States, and actually a portion of it uh, went into uh, to Europe. Telephone? That's just for rich men and gabby women. Nothing but a gadget. Oh, he says that, does he? Well, you listen to me, Mr. Kendall. You've got an uncle who's a fool, and you can quote me. You're talking to a man who helped install one of the very first switchboards there ever was, back in New Haven in 78, who helped string the first line between cities, from Boston to Providence. A man who's seen what this telephone has done for the country already in 25 years. A gadget, is it? One thing to keep in mind as you're talking about the phone company in the 1960s and 70s and even up into the early 80s, for the most part, it really is one giant company. It was all run by AT&T. American Telephone and Telegraph was a monopoly. It was, in fact, the largest company on Earth. Today's telephone network far exceeds Mr. Bell's grandest dream. And every last inch of it can be linked together to serve the home, business, or continental defense. The very size and diversity of this network helped to make it strong. The telephone system was the closest thing that anybody got to a computer, and the sophistication of the telephone system and the telephone network was really approaching that of a computer. And so the phone company was really sort of the forerunner of a lot of computing. Phone freaks were, you know, today they'd be called network hackers, right? The only difference is they're playing around with the telephone. Finally tonight we have a report on phone freaks underground hobbyists who make illegal phone calls around the country by confounding the technology of the telephone companies with technology of their own. For this phone freaking business to make any sense at all, you, you almost have to get in a time machine because you have to go back in time to a time that is really unlike today. That in the very old days, when you wanted to make a long distance call, what you did was you picked up the telephone and you talked to an operator and you said, I want to call Chicago, and here's my phone number, that operator would get another operator on the line, which might involve maybe a couple intermediate cities, and you'd eventually get to Chicago. So there were human beings in the loop the whole way through. What made phone freaking possible was 
when that started to get automated, where operators started to get out of the loop so that you could actually use automated equipment to place a call from you know, San Francisco to Chicago. And what that meant, the automated equipment had some vulnerabilities in it, which allowed somebody with a little bit of technical skill to be able to place their own calls or reroute the calls or otherwise play with things. John Draper, who's uh, known as his phone freak handle as Captain Crunch, was the guy who discovered something really interesting about Captain Crunch cereal. Back in the day, Captain Crunch cereal came with a little prize, and one of the prizes was a little tiny whistle, a little plastic whistle, and it turned out that if you covered up one of the holes in the whistle, it actually allowed you to generate a perfect 2600 hertz tone, and that you could use to whistle your way into free phone calls. So if you were good at whistling and you could whistle 2600 hertz, um, you could actually whistle your way to free phone calls. And there were several people who could do that. The most famous was a phone freak uh, at the time known as Joe Ingressia, later known as Joy Bubbles, who was uh, a blind fellow, gifted with perfect pitch and able to whistle free phone calls. Let's see if I make it this time. This is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing about now. Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while to... Now From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand-mile phone call by whistling. So this is a huge problem because we're not talking about software today where you just patch a few lines of code and you know mail out a CD-ROM or have people download updates from the Internet. This is physical plant. This is, you know, central offices all throughout the country that are using, you know, big huge racks of equipment that this has got to change if you want to patch this hole. In addition, phone calls were really expensive. It might cost, you know, the equivalent in today's dollars of $55 for a 10-minute uh, phone call from San Francisco to New York, right? It was really expensive. Long distance was a big deal back then. Everyone knows long distance rates are lowest at night. But did you know those same low rates are in effect all day on Sunday? You can make a three-minute station-to-station call to any of 48 states for 90 cents or less, anytime on Sunday. The way a blue box worked is it was based on the observation that when a line is idle, there's this 2600 hertz tone on it. So the first thing you do with a blue box is once you've dialed a long-distance call and the call is starting to go through, you would send a burst of 2600 down the line. And that 2600 hertz would confuse the remote central office. And now they're again listening for those, they're called multi-frequency digits. So a blue box is kind of like a touchstone generator that can generate these special digits. And with those, you can now dial your own call. So if you were a bookmaker uh, as part of organized crime, you spent a lot of time on the telephone. That cost you a lot of money in the 1960s. And even worse, it left telephone records that the FBI could later get to figure out who your associates were. If you were using a blue box, you didn't have to do that. The problem the phone company had is that they had, from the 1940s on, based their entire network and infrastructure around this multi-frequency signaling system. They had been rolling this out across the entire United States. They'd spent a lot of money on this. And then it turns out that, well, it's got this problem. That, you know, a guy with a blue box and a tone generator, or even a guy who can whistle, can make free phone calls. And some estimates at the time were that it would be, you know, upwards of a billion dollars, and this is back when a billion dollars was real money, to fix this whole thing. So you've got this vulnerability. What do you do about it? You can't make it go away overnight, you know. Even if you had a billion dollars, you couldn't make it go away overnight. So then you, have, you get into this problem of, well, we're obviously going to have to live with this for a while. But at the same time, we want to keep this as quiet as possible so that, you know, it doesn't get out that we have this problem. But then how do you, what do you do when you catch somebody, when you catch a college kid who's figured out how to make a blue box? You've got a blue box outbreak someplace, right? What do you do about that? Because if you prosecute and it gets into the newspapers, you might well have just done yourself more harm than good. Now everybody in that area reads about it and says, oh, what's the blue box? That sounds pretty good. I'd like to be able to make free phone calls. So 
So in 1971, there was an article in Esquire magazine by Ron Rosenbaum, which was called Secrets of the Little Blue Box, which elevated phone freedom to national attention. It was so well written and so intriguingly written, it made what was essentially a boring and geeky hobby of playing around with the telephone system seem like it was something out of an espionage novel. And it really captured the imagination of so many people. The phone company now is a real problem because they still haven't fixed their network. They've got a fix on the horizon, but that fix is going to take time to deploy. And now you've got all these people who know about it. When phone freaks have a convention, as they did in the ballroom of a seedy New York hotel lately, masks are given out at the door, people don't give their right names, and the illegal electronic devices which phone freaks use to defraud the telephone companies are nowhere to be seen. So the cat's out of the bag at this point. So at that point, starting right after, uh, around 1970, 1971, right after the Esquire article, the phone company started to adopt much more of a prosecutorial stance, where every time we find this, we're going to prosecute it, we're going to go to law enforcement. And now at this point, it has to be just pure deterrence. We have to scare people into not doing this. One of the things that, they, that the phone company did when it became aware of blue and black boxes was it started an internal uh, investigation unit. And from 1964 to 1970, they randomly monitored some 33 million long-distance calls. And of those 33 million calls, they actually tape-recorded between 1.5 and 1.8 million calls. So in some sense, it's probably the largest warrantless wiretapping campaign that anybody has ever undertaken, and it was done entirely without any approval from anyone, the government or anything else. It was simply AT&T doing this. Keep your eye on that bell, son, and mark my words. But as this nation grows, the telephone will grow with it, and it'll play a strong part in that growth. And the future that lies ahead is beyond the belief of any man. Much of what we've learned about the universe has actually come from radio telescopes uh, because they can see things that optical telescopes can't. Uh, and behind me is one such amateur radio telescope here in my backyard. Uh, this is a 12-foot satellite dish that's been repurposed to operate as a telescope. If you're a professional astronomer, you usually are using very large instruments and you have limited uh, time to use them because you're competing with other folks for, for the instrument. Uh, if you have your own system, you can run it as much as you want and observe anything you wish. Um, and the people who do this uh, are hardware hackers. Uh, these are folks who, just like in the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, want access to something that ordinary people normally can't have. Well, there's no question that what came out of the Homebrew Computer Club changed the world in a major way. Some may wonder, when did the computer begin to really compete with television and radio uh, for our personal attention? I'd say that for members of the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, that competition uh, began back in 1975. And folks building their own systems became obsessed with what they were doing to the point where not only were they not necessarily watching much TV, at, at the, uh, but they were probably not spending much time with their families. <laughs> because it was very time consuming to design and construct and code your own machine. One of the most well-known members of the Homebrew Computer Club was uh, Steve Wozniak. I was there the night that Steve brought in a circuit board that he said he was going to call the Apple and uh, wanted to know what we all thought about it. It was pretty cool. He had mounted a circuit board onto a piece of wood and had a keyboard on it. It was a self-contained computer. Uh, a lot of the folks in the club were making systems that were somewhat similar. Uh, no one at the time had any idea where his system was going to go. Nobody in the large corporate environment really saw much use for the computer in the home. In fact, uh, when we first uh, developed these systems, there was a lot of skepticism that we had heard from people on the outside saying, why do you want a computer? Who needs a computer? What good would it be to have one in your house? And uh, uh, they just didn't get it. <laughs> Comes as no surprise to say that it's all but impossible to conduct any kind of business these days without a computer. What is new is that computers are suddenly becoming a factor beyond business. Overnight, manufacturing personal computers has become a half billion dollar business, one that's doubling every two years. Stephen Jobs is a 27-year-old multimillionaire whose large fortune is built on something little, the personal computer. How many calculators do you own? 
two, maybe. Right. And you have to use the automatic bank telling machines? Sure. So life is already seducing you into learning this stuff. Random access memory is internal memory that's built inside of this computer. They talk their own language here. At trade shows across the country, when manufacturers show off their wares, the house is usually packed. Small personal computers, selling from $500 to $5,000, are fast becoming a multi-billion dollar business. And if words like bits and bytes mean nothing, try this one. Money. I have seen the future, said one industry observer, and it computes. It is becoming so commonplace that many of us are becoming dependent on it something that didn't exist a few years ago to a, a very large business today. And in the future, uh, of course, personal computers, a lot of people anticipate, will be as ubiquitous as the telephone. Computers have become personal tools as prices dropped and components shrank. This personal computer costs about $1,400 and fits nicely on a desk corner. The idea of the small computer has become so big that the giant of computer companies, IBM, is busy marketing its new small computer. IBM spending an estimated 13 million dollars on TV this year alone. Wall Street hit a record high again today. One of the better performers was IBM. The first reliable computer was built by an American about 50 years ago. Since then, computers have multiplied like fury. Big Mac Day, the day Apple unveiled its new Macintosh computer to shareholder. Suddenly, personal computers have become the business of at least 25 manufacturers. Radio Shack, Apple, and Commodore grabbing three quarters of the market. For weeks, the Macintosh has been rolling off the line, one every 27 seconds. A whole generation is being weaned on computers, and manufacturers say that guarantees that computers will become the household appliance of the near future. In more and more schools, small computers are taking over the job of teaching reading or math or foreign languages. A generation of children is becoming comfortable with computers. Steve Wozniak co-founded Apple, the most successful of all home computer companies. In just six years, Apple has become a half billion dollar a year corporation, leaving Wozniak worth more than 50 million dollars. Retired now at 32, Wozniak had never been to an outdoor rock concert, so he took 12 and a half million of his dollars and bought one. The significance of the emergence of the personal computer really can't be understated. Its impact has been profound and uh, reaches almost every corner of our lives. <laughs> The big changeover came when people started getting modems on their home computers. So you got the home computer and you can, you know, you can play your game on it or whatever. And there were these bulletin board systems out there. And the bulletin board systems, you'd have somebody who was a hobbyist also would get a computer and put a couple of modems on it and write a bulletin board package that allowed people to dial in and yell at each other, or make friends, fight talk about whatever their hobby was. 200 years ago in this country, notices were tacked up on a tree in the village square which served as a community bulletin board. And in the years since, when people wanted to post a bill, they've used fences, barns, walls, and buses, not to mention newspapers. But now the village bulletin board has gone electronic. Generally in your neighborhood or in your dialing area, there'd be maybe 50, 60, 80 bulletin boards for you to call. And in a really small town, there might only be five or 10. And each bulletin board had a different sort of group of follower. Like the engineers might like this one, the hackers might like that one, the game people might like this one, the hobbyists might like that one. And so you'd get accounts on a bunch of systems locally to figure out what the local scene was like. Phone long distance kept getting cheaper, so it went from these standalone island bulletin boards to a network. And some of these networks had thousands and thousands of other bulletin boards. Back then, it was probably 83 or something, and computers were just blown up. We were in San Francisco near Silicon Valley, and my dad decided it was time to get the family a computer. My sister had no interest in it, so therefore it ended up in my room, and that's when I got hooked, addicted to computers. And one guy I was totally jealous of, he had a modem. He had a 110 baud acoustic coupler modem, which is what you see in old movies now. But through that, he'd dial up the phone, stick it on the coupler, and dial up bulletin boards in the San Francisco Bay Area. And through my friend's computer, a whole new universe opened up for me. It was unbelievable. You could be on a, a bulletin board chat system as a 14-year-old kid. Nobody knows your name. Nobody knows your age. Nobody knows your education, your ethnicity, anything about you. All they know about is what you type on the keyboard. So their entire uh, opinion of you is based on how logical or how intelligent you sound. So you could have these great debates about music or movies or whatever it is, 
And for all I know that you could be a professor at Berkeley. And that was really liberating because all it taught me was all about what you know. It wasn't about what you looked like or where you were from or any of that because that just didn't come into the picture. And the other thing is, is it opened up this whole other adult universe. You know, you're like 13, 14 years old, you're kind of sheltered, you know, you can't drive a car, you're not watching R-rated movies. And here you are talking about drugs or movies or sex or whatever it is, adult concepts, and you're like 14 years old. That just, the whole world opened up through the computer for me. It was awesome. Because in those days, it, it really did feel like exploring. There was no standard addressing the WW at whatever. You, you kind of just got this phone number and you would get in there and then you'd see what was on the other side of that computer and where it led to. Because there were people who really weren't internet users. You couldn't really track them back and figure out what machine they were coming from because they were some kid sitting in their parents' basement with a modem attached to a computer. And they were on this fairly small sea of information, but they were completely anonymous and they had no vested interest in behaving because they could misbehave all that they wanted and then all they had to do was turn off their connection and disappear. And I remember back then, you would, you would start to get the first generation of the war games dialers or war dialers who would call all of the telephones in an entire urban area and see if a modem picked up. got a pickup. They would try to log in as guest, password guest, you know, admin, password admin. And sometimes they'd get in and it was it was fairly shocking. When it makes contact with the wall of the maze and discovers it cannot go straight ahead, it turns and keeps on turning till it has found its way again. It explores each step of the way with its copper whiskers. Those of us who were running the machines on the administrative side, the main problem that we were seeing is we would just see in our system logs that you know someone had tried to log in as guest 800 times and we'd laugh because maybe we didn't have a guest account and we'd know that somebody was playing around and it was all seen as kind of as fairly benign activity because we hadn't really started to see a downstream cost for all of this kind of activity. In the mid 80s, a lot of the hackers would launch physical attacks. They would go find a phone company office and they would walk in with a clipboard and try to look official and they would look around and they'd try to find a modem. You know, if you found a computer sitting someplace and it had a modem connected to it, frequently if you turned the modem over there'd be a little plastic tag with the phone number that the modem was sitting on and sometimes there'd be usernames and passwords. And some of the hackers had no, no qualms whatsoever about, you know, just walking into a building and um, coming out with whatever information they could. Pretty much every kid who's interested in science and technology at some point or another goes over the edge of the dumpster. But there were always people who would be going in there and looking for printouts, and it was really pretty shocking, some of the stuff that you would find getting thrown away. Oh, wow, look, it's billing information from the hospital from five years ago. There wasn't really a model for how to make money off of that stuff. And we didn't realize at the time how much it was going to wind up costing us in the long run. It was kind of a hobby environment where people didn't really feel like there was anything wrong with going and diving in somebody's dumpster and trying to come out with, you know, whatever you could find. But things were a little bit more Wild West in those days. In the early days, you couldn't own a computer, it was too expensive. You couldn't get on the internet, it was only for universities and governments. You couldn't get a computer programming manual generally, and you, you couldn't learn anything about security because it, there wasn't anything really written. So everything was closed, and you had to break into it. You had to find a way in. You had to break into a university to get access on a computer, and then you'd read all the manual pages learning out how did the computer actually work because there was no material available. And then you had to find somebody that knew something about security and convince them to teach you. And then maybe you would teach someone else. And then you'd build this community around sharing information. I think it would have been unheard of in the mid-1980s that if you found some kid wandering around in a telephone company building that they'd call the police and have the guy hauled off. Nowadays, in the days of Homeland Security, the guy would be at Gitmo being waterboarded or something. You know, what were you doing in the phone company offices, all this kind of thing. Um, but in the 80s, it was it was kind of cute, you know, and that's how you get these guys like like Kevin Mitnick, who are, you know, basically loser sociopaths, but the entire community sees them as as cute and interesting people. We love you, Kevin! 
<laughs> Kevin Mitnick is arguably the most famous former hacker. At you got me, dude. At the hacker gathering in Las Vegas, where he now lives and works as a security consultant, to, uh, he's treated like a celebrity. He served nearly five years in federal prison for breaking into systems at several major corporations. If the 80s was the Wild West, the 90s would have been the gold rush. That was when things really started to get interesting, and, and that's when the knives came out as well, because suddenly you were injecting value into it. Right? As soon as the money comes, then, then you get this, these, these streams of parasites coming in after the money. And the innocence of the internet really ended around 1994. Can't afford a computer at home? It's okay if you have some spare change. Coin-operated computer terminals have started popping up in public places like this San Francisco coffee house. Users send electronic mail all over the globe. Cost two bits for four minutes. Connecting people in new ways has become a major business in this country. Commercial services like Prodigy, CompuServe, and America Online, which pump information into people's computers through regular phone lines, now have four million subscribers. The fastest growing of these services, America Online, charges $9.95 a month plus $3.50 an hour after the first five hours of use. As soon as the internet hit, I'm saying within two years, um, within two years probably dial bulletin boards went away. I mean, they died that quickly. What was the point of dialing up and having the slow interaction where you could get online immediately? So what happened there is information sharing took a great leap forward, but the community collapsed because anybody can come to your system now on the internet from anywhere. So you got a whole lot of idiots, people that you couldn't filter them out. I mean, they used to call it the AOL effect. When the AOL dial-up system hit the internet and all those people, millions of users, flooded into the, the, the early internet, it was just, you know, the, the IQ level just dropped like a rock. And so that forced the people that were trying to have serious conversations on the net into the corners, into private groups. Uh, and, it, and it stratified the internet. AOL was a really interesting aspect of the early history of the internet. They used their huge dial-up infrastructure to become this portal to the internet for millions of people. And that's part of why AOL got so rich, that they were able to buy Time Warner, if you think about that. That moment epitomized the early stage of the internet gold rush. Here you have an old school mainline media company, which is used to kind of shaping American popular culture, gets bought by a bunch of computer kids who just appear out of no place. And it was, uh, as we all know now, it was a merger made in hell. But that was really kind of the, the symbol of the early stage of the gold rush. From a security standpoint, AOL's coming on the internet brought us millions of new users. And I think that was really when you first started to see people doing scams to get people's passwords, people doing online fraud, right? The millions of new users means millions of new victims. People were literally just kind of buying machines and plugging them in as fast as they could. And everybody was saying, well, we'll worry about securing it later. And now for a traffic report of sorts. This one is from the Information Superhighway. In a word, it is jammed. The rush online jams the internet. And for some, the World Wide Web becomes the World Wide Wait. Hacking really changed when money got involved, when computers became free, when AOL gave away free internet access, when everybody has a spare computer. The things you were, that were motivating you in the first place are no longer there. So you have to find a new reason. What's the new thing that motivates you if all the old motivations are gone? All of the systems, all of the software, all of the components on which the first the first couple of years of the big commercial internet were built, none of it was designed really with good security in mind. I'm informed that you uh, think that it, within 30 minutes, the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. It would definitely take a few days for people to figure out what was going on. This will be an ongoing effort to try to make sure we get all the benefits of the internet, all the benefits of the computer revolution, but we, we develop better defenses and better defenders. Hacking has changed a lot over the years. It, it, it used to be um, almost an intellectual pursuit. Uh, I, I heard it likened to um, uh, spelunking once, you know, where you're just kind of exploring. And in, in the late 80s, early 90s, it, it very much felt like that. There, there was this uh, cavernous 
dark internet and you could find things in there if you went looking. And most of the people that I knew at the time that did that uh, were, were out for access, they were out for exploration, for learning, that sort of thing. Very few people were out for uh, profit. Police say they've arrested the, the cyber mastermind responsible for infecting 12 million computers around the world. Today, it's very, very different. Even the, the hacker mentality is a much different breed. Some of the younger kids have a moral flexibility that uh, would make a uh, Fortune 500 CEO blush. The hackers nowadays are oftentimes professionals. Uh, they've been trained to do this. They work for organizations that do this. You yourself sitting at home, um, you know, shopping online and reading your email, you are the target and they're after you, and they're after your financial information, they're after your money. Well, in Eastern Europe, you have a lot of individuals that are very intelligent, but underemployed. And that may sound cliche, but that is the circumstance that they're in. And so uh, they become entrepreneurs and they create companies. However, the motivation of the company is not to make money for the common good, it's to make money for themselves. And so they remain black hats and they remain hackers. Computer hackers in Russia reportedly succeeded in breaking into the electronic money transfer system of Citibank. Organized hacker groups, primarily from Russia and Ukraine, are said to be targeting US companies, stealing millions of dollars in credit card numbers. There's a lot of bias that exists. When I work with U.S. representatives, you know, they would say that, oh, this other country is attacking us. And then I go to the other uh, country and they're saying, oh, the Americans are attacking us and they're more technologically advanced. So every country is panicking about each other. The newspaper gets all upset, you know, North Korea or China is hacking into our computers. Well, yeah, they are. But the other side is the United States is doing that to Russia and China and Japan and France is doing it to us and England's doing it to Norway and everyone's doing it. The advantage that I have is I'm in a sense neutral. I'm in the business of tech, media, cyber security. I don't particularly represent any government or uh, any, any corporation. Not so distant is the day of low-cost computers for home use. Then little Johnny won't have to embarrass Daddy with his homework questions. His tabletop computer will answer the really tough ones. Growing up, being a little boy, I always looked at technology and media as a means to look at a window to the outside. And my father was the first person who brought uh, a personal computer into the Soviet Union. And I remember being a little boy uh, playing on this massive machine, typing like this, big keys. And uh, all of this made me realize how important and how fast this technology grows. It really, truly is a fascinating place. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. You have air, land, space, and maritime. Cyber is the new sphere. It's the fifth common domain. It's not just internet. Cyber is your cell phone, your mobile phone connected to your PC, which is connected to to the grid, which is connected, the grid's connected to the traffic lights, to the air traffic control, to the satellites, to the nuclear weapons, to the nuclear power station and the arms forces. So suddenly you have this massive connection everywhere. It is kind of amazing the uh, transformations that have occurred even in my lifetime, and I'm not that old. We've seen just an increase in 
data being everywhere and the ability to access things on the internet. Whenever my kids ask me a question and I don't know the answer, they say, well, we should just ask Google. Google knows. Um, and they just kind of take for granted that information is out there and available. Privacy was sort of de facto protected in the olden days just by virtue of how difficult it was to collect information. And now with computer technology, what's happened is that it's really made the collection of this information very cheap and easy because primarily a lot of companies have interest in collecting information about you and consumers have an interest in giving up this information about themselves, whether it be to a social network that knows who your friends are or to Amazon that knows what books you're interested in or to Google that knows what you're searching for. I remember at one point when I was traveling in China and um, in the, the gift shops that they like to bring American tourists into, they, they actually do follow you around. And every time you look at something, they, they offer a suggestion that, that, oh, very nice product, you should purchase it. Um, and it was kind of a creepy feeling. And that's sort of what happens online. When you use a bookseller like Amazon.com, they're keeping information not only about what books you buy and where your house is that they have to ship the books to, but about what books you browse. All that information gets collected and stored and is potentially available to civil litigants and to the government later on. And this is some of the most private kinds of information, what books you're interested in, what you search on Google. Um, you know, Google looks at your search histories and they use that information for all sorts of purposes. Think about how you would feel if somebody could get access to what you're searching for. It's basically, what are you thinking? What are you interested in? Some of the most intimate, personal information that's, that's out there. As we move around with our mobile phones, we move from cell tower to cell tower, and this creates records. And these records are retained by the service carriers for many years, ostensibly for billing disputes. But they can also be used later to figure out where you were at any given moment in time. Every time you have your cell phone on, not even when you're making a call, but just when you have your cell phone on, that enables them to find out physically where you are is something that I think is really of concern to people. Um, people think that that information should be private. And we understand that we could be followed on the public street, but we think that that requires the government to have a good reason and to be, to be worth the money for them to appoint an officer to follow us. In the U.S., we actually don't have very many privacy laws, which comes as a surprise to a lot of people who just sort of assume that the government maybe is protecting them. There is no right to privacy in this country. Let me just say that out loud. Uh, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in any of the Bill of Rights or any other amendment. There is no right to privacy. The way it is now, I don't own my own identity. If I give it to Facebook, they own it. I can't go back to them and say, you know what? I want to change that. I don't want that to be visible anymore. They say, too bad. You gave it to us. It's in our systems. It's there forever. Uh, we're going to sell it, we're going to monetize it, we're going to create psychographic, you know, analysis of who our users are so we can better target advertising to them. People think that they're the customers of Facebook or Google or LiveJournal or Twitter. In, in fact, they're not, right? They're the products of these companies that they sell to their customers who are the advertisers. Right? The reason Facebook is free, the reason Gmail is free, is not because the company likes you. It's because you are their product, and by making it free, they get a better product that they can sell to their advertisers. Over the last few years, we've heard the CEOs of uh, several major technology companies talk about the death of privacy. Eric Schmidt of Google talks about it, Larry Ellison of Oracle. Uh, we're hearing it from uh, Mort Zuckerberg of Facebook, that the rules of privacy are changing and people expect less privacy. What's interesting is those are the very CEOs that are deliberately undermining privacy. At a presentation to advertisers in 2007, Mark Zuckerberg pitched the benefits of Facebook's vast database. On Facebook, we know exactly what gender someone is and exactly how old they are and exactly what they're interested in. We're finding a very slow and deliberate ratcheting down of privacy from all of these companies because they make money from people sharing, from information being visible, from information being collated and networked, and being seen by others. A lot of my friends have grown up with nothing but computers. That's all they know are computers. Well, starting with them, there's an electronic digital record of everything they've ever done online. Now, whether or not the record is kept, somebody deletes the hard drive or throws away the backup tapes, fine. But records are being kept. Hard drives, data storage is cheap. It'll be around forever. 
So can you imagine the implications? How does that change your behavior if everything you've ever done is recorded somewhere? Can you imagine what the presidential debates will be like 20, 30 years from now when they're pulling up your first tweet, your first Facebook love note, your first status change on Google Talk where you said you were going to go get hammered? I mean, it's fundamentally going to change the way the people behave. I mean, there's a common myth that privacy is about something to hide. I don't have anything to hide, so I don't need privacy. But you know that's not true. I mean, we don't have anything to hide when we, uh, you know, sing in the shower or write a love letter and then tear it up. You know, privacy is about uh, us as individuals. It's about our ability to be who we are without necessarily telling everybody. I mean, when someone says I have nothing to hide, just ask them, what's your salary? What are your sexual fetishes? You know, what kind of diseases do you have? I mean, these, it's not about hiding, it's about personal dignity. This baby is just one second old. Here in the delivery room of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, he has just won his first fight, the fight to life. His footprints are taken for identification. He is still less than a minute old, and this is his first record. This newborn boy and all the others of his generation face a new and serious battle which they may not win, the right to privacy. Data is a fundamental byproduct of every computer-mediated interaction. You right? used to throw a quarter into a toll booth, now you use an easy pass and a record is saved. You used to chat with someone uh, you know, over a water cooler or across a, a partition in your office, but now that's done over IM or SMS and that data is being saved. Right? So things that used to be ephemeral are now permanent. And more and more that data is being saved and sifted through and used uh, by government, by corporations, by marketers. I mean, you can find, if you go on the net and you start searching for, uh, maybe you're going to buy a new house or, or move in and get a new apartment, you start looking at real estate or rental listings, you go on Facebook and suddenly you're going to see ads for real estate companies or rental companies. You know, and that sometimes feels a bit icky. You know, we're finding more and more that as people surf on the net, they're being followed. They're being followed and a profile about them is being collected and then sold to others. And this is without people's knowledge or consent. You might sort of know what's going on, but not really. A meeting of the American Civil Liberties Union in Washington. These men are fearful that the National Data Center poses a threat to privacy and the American way of life. All we can expect is to hold off the data bank for a while, to get in our links, because there are not only governmental data banks, there are private data banks. The data center is not just here and now. You build it with the best intentions now, you build it with limitations now, and tomorrow those intentions may pass and the limitations may dissolve. We always talk about security versus privacy, as if there's some sort of balance. And the government likes to use that trade-off, I mean, how much privacy would you give up for security? You know, being secure requires you to give up some privacy. I think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's actually a red herring. Security and privacy go hand in hand. You know, we do not feel more secure when our private data is released. We don't feel more secure in a police state with its ubiquitous surveillance. That privacy is essential for security. And good security provides her privacy. I mean, it's only bad security that goes in opposition to privacy. And a great example is airplane security. After 9-11, there have been exactly two things that have improved security. The first one is reinforcing the cockpit door, and the second is passengers knowing they have to fight back. Those two measures have nothing to do with privacy. And if you think about the airplane security measures that affect privacy, the photo ID check, uh, the full body scanners, they actually don't improve security. They're what I call security theater. Real security goes hand in hand with privacy. How do we create a world where freedom and expression is still valued and protected at the same time as, uh, as, as uh, security is maintained? So there will always be a battle, a battle between privacy, security, and the essence of the internet.
is Harry Bumpo, a real great guy. Harry's a very busy man, and he's conscientious and hardworking. But security-wise, Harry is naive. What? You heard me. You don't know what security is. What do you mean? Information security has a physical component. There, there, there's no doubt about it. Uh, it's not just someone from overseas trying to get in with a, uh, an exploit. That's, that's kind of the trick shot of hacking. There's a physical aspect to it, especially at a local level, where if people can access your data networks, they can steal your data. And we're often paid to, to, to test that. One of my favorite ways into a, a company is the smoking door. You'll find like a card swipe to get in and out. So all you have to do is find the smoking door, walk up to the door when no one's there, and have a lit cigarette. When the door opens, just quickly crush out your cigarette and say thank you, grab the door and walk in, and it, it works every time. Another really clever way that uh, I like getting in is a uh, USB key, uh, which uh, I've written some very simple software that um, will use the computer it's plugged into to tunnel out and give us control of that computer. And then we take that key and we label it um, usually something to the effect of your company's name and HR, you know, something tempting to, to plug in. And then we have someone walk that into the receptionist and explain that they found it in the parking lot or they found it in the lobby of the building and it's got your name on it, it must be yours. Uh, of course, this minutes after the person drops the key, you know, we're waiting for this and we get the, the hookup from the uh, computer when they plug it in and then uh, we're in and off and running. Would it be dangerous for everyone to walk around with the knowledge I have? I would worry about that. Throughout my career, I've made a lot of difficult choices. The temptation to just do something that goes over the line is always there. I've been working at this for many, many years. I have a lot of experience. And I've been offered uh, some pretty tempting things. Uh, in, in one case, a briefcase full of cash to do something that was very wrong. It would have very, been very easy to do, probably wouldn't have gotten caught. But you have to make a decision in life because once you go to that side and get caught, you can never really come back. People can't protect what they don't understand. You, how do you evaluate the risk around what's the risk of having a computer-controlled car? Well. People don't really know. We've never had computer-controlled cars before, and it's not something that we sort of intuitively understand. You know, if you're at the ATM and there's a shady guy next to you, you get that, like viscerally. Your brain, your little you know, reptile part of your brain says, danger, danger, something weird's here. But your brain doesn't necessarily pick up that the keypad looks a little unusual because somebody swapped it with a keyboard capturing device. Or where you put your card into the ATM, that looks a little fatter than it normally does. Well, that's because somebody's put a capture device over it. We don't get that intuitively, not like a shady character right there. And so, as humans, we just aren't good at estimating and managing risk when it comes to computers. And that's gonna get us into all kinds of trouble. I see people that will go out to a public, free public Wi-Fi cafe and they'll access their banking information or they'll make a purchase online and they won't stop and think, is this a safe place for me to be conducting a transaction? Is this something I should be doing out in public? Until we start thinking in those terms, I think we're going to find that the problem of identity theft and cybercrime is going to be with us for a while. A lot of people who are on the network, people we want to have on the network, like my mom and dad, aren't really capable of securing their own computer system or maybe even of understanding why it is that they shouldn't be checking their email or their bank statement in the coffee shop or something like that. Um, or they may just simply misassess the risk. They may understand that there's a risk that somebody might be using a sniffer and they look around the room and they think everybody looks pretty busy, you know, reading the paper and drinking their coffee and they really need to get their email and they take that chance. Um, I just don't think that it's fair to put the full burden of that on the individual. There's a whole hobby called board driving, which is just driving around and accessing other people's wireless networks and seeing how many you can rack up. It's really easy to just drive around the neighborhood and get into people's networks. And even if they have basic wireless encryption, 
that's usually not preventing people because most of those protocols have been hacked and you don't even need to do any work to get in. Once you're in someone's wireless network, then you're seeing all the traffic that's getting sent across. So if they're typing credit card information or social security numbers, that data can be sniffed right out of the air by anyone within range of that network. And there are people driving around just trying to do that for fun. So if someone wants to steal your private information, they're probably going to get it. Years ago, you'd have to have a complete computer system with you to do any hacking or access to a complete computer system. Uh, nowadays, you can make a complete hacking system out of a cell phone. This looks like a fairly typical iPhone, or at least it, it would appear so. This iPhone has been modified, though, to run applications that are not approved by Apple. In this case, specifically one designed to remotely take over other computers from either across the internet or, in our case, across an open public wireless network. It's actually a, a, a cafe. So we'll start by pulling up a terminal, and then in this terminal, what we're going to do is run an application called Metasploit that will allow us to run an exploit and take over a machine. You can look at the exploit as how you get into the vulnerable application. So having identified a specific computer from across the street over an open wireless network, we'll select our exploit first. In our case, we're going to choose a Microsoft exploit since our computer that we're looking at appears to be um, quite uh, behind on its patches. We're going to choose a payload that causes that machine to give us control of it. And a payload is what you want the machine to do once you've exploited a vulnerable service. All right, now we're ready to go. Let's give it a try. We type exploit and enter. and we have successfully exploited our target. We now have control of it. At this point, we would set software on this computer so that when the person leaves the cafe, the machine would report all user activity. That activity would include websites visited, login IDs, and password pairs. We could even activate the camera or the microphone on the particular computer at will. So we'd have complete control over it. So, I mean, that right there, is 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 pretty cool yeah um that's, 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 yeah. hacking and causing disruption is sipping into the mainstream into the general public you no longer have to be an M mit or a cambridge uh, computer science graduate to know how to hack into a system you can just be a kid from around the block go buy a computer for 400 bucks have a connection for 30 bucks and go online and figure out how to hack into different systems. Having been through the maze just once, the mechanical mouse is able to remember the correct path. Set down anywhere along that path, it takes the most direct route without making a single false turn on through to the end of the trail. As the crime continues to be effective and make money and the victims become more numerous that you're, you're going to get uh, the effect where people start saying well someone should do something about that and the victim there is going to be freedom in um, on the internet all right all right i'll abide by your red tape regulations red tape regulations I'll wear a badge and lock my desk when I go home at night. But I still say we've got guards for that sort of thing. We'd have to put a permanent guard on everyone in the business. We probably could build a society in which it was impossible for people to steal from each other, but the consequences of building that society are probably a society none of us would want to live in. There'd be a tremendous amount of surveillance. There would be a tremendous amount of onerous security on top of us. We could build an internet where there were no hackers. The downside of building an internet where there were no hackers would be an internet where there was no anonymity. There was no ability to post anything that was not subject to censorship. You might find yourself being held liable for anything that you said because it could be proven to be having come from you. If we built a perfect internet that was completely hacker-proof, we have built a perfect surveillance system for Big Brother that you can never evade.
We meet today at a transformational moment, a moment in history when our interconnected world presents us at once with great promise, but also great peril. The very technologies that empower us to create and to build also empower those who would disrupt and destroy. This world, cyberspace, is a world that we depend on every single day. It's our hardware and our software, our desktops and laptops and cell phones and Blackberries that have become woven into every aspect of our lives. It's the broadband networks beneath us and the wireless signals around us, the local networks in our schools and hospitals and businesses, and the massive grids that power our nation. It's the classified military and intelligence networks that keep us safe, and the World Wide Web that has made us more interconnected than at any time in human history. The vast majority of our critical information infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. Traditionally, government military stuff and civilian stuff were different. Right? They'd be even the, you know, both had planes, the avionics would be different. Both had computers, they would work differently. That's changing. Technology is moving so fast that government can't keep up. Right? They're forced to buy the same stuff that we use. Now, that's a very interesting situation. Everybody's using the same operating systems, the same networking architecture, the same hardware, the same software. And whether it's a person or a bank or a military or a foreign military, we're all using the same stuff. And yes, this is different and we're not used to it. It's not going away. You know, we're never going to go back to the military being on the leading edge because leading edge moves so fast and only industry has that distributed ability to try every option and have the correct ones succeed. Right? Only the market can do that. Government can't. The government is forced to rely on corporate security. We've just come out with the CyberScope, which is uh, this probe right here. And as far as network security, it takes it to a new level. We have over 140 federal agencies that use this, from the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, as well as um, in civilian agencies. We sell a bit to um, the military and U.S. government, uh, but we also sell to organizations that are just trying to audit their systems. So all of a sudden you have the military with you know, next generation cellular communications in an area that typically wasn't available. The private industry owns at least 85% uh, of the digital infrastructure that we are also dependent upon. When you mention cybersecurity to most members of Congress, they just kind of glaze over. And they, uh, they don't really get it. They don't want to get it. My administration will pursue a new comprehensive approach to securing America's digital infrastructure. I think there is a lack of understanding among the politicians. And uh, it might be due to the the fact that the know-how has moved to the younger generation and they are not very eager to move to politics. I get the phone call and um, it's like, you know, hi, I'm, I'm from the White House. Well, actually, I'm really from DHS. Well, actually, I'm the liaison between the two, so, you know, I have a couple different titles. But anyway, there's this Homeland Security Advisory Council we want you to be a part of. And I'm thinking, oh, that's not so bad. I can read white papers. I can provide my advice. Sure, yeah, sure, I'll, yeah, I'll take it. And the next day I come into work and I've got all these, you know, ethics disclosure forms and, you know, Office of Professional Responsibility and security clearance. I call them back and I say, how is this really working? What are my responsibilities? You know, but as a technologist, I get to deal with a lot of questions that touch our lives every day because almost every government initiative depends on IT systems. Anything to do with border crossing, that's technology. Air traffic control, FEMA, emergency communications, all of this stuff relies on computer networks. But there's never been an overarching coordination. And to me, that's an acknowledgement that, that there has never been a recognition on the part of, of the federal government that this is a really serious thing. Nations want secrets. They're going to break into governments and companies and try to steal plans and chemical formulas and troop movements and how we route airplanes things that might help them at a very strategic level or might give their companies a, a competitive advantage. China's interests have been long-term to look at um, our government, 
and to look at what our military is doing, looking at what various agencies of the federal government are up to, and also what our academic institutions are capable of doing, uh, stealing research and the intellectual property associated with universities. And they even go so far as to look at individual companies and trying to figure out what their business plans might be and how they might impact Chinese companies. CBS News has learned that there are factories in China and Southeast Asia that are exact replicas of plants in the United States, built with everything from hacked blueprints and supplier lists down to the settings used to regulate valve pressures for individual machines. Two years ago, hackers stole top-secret exploration data from oil and gas industry giants ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips and Marathon Oil. In 2007, the cyber systems of Central Command, the State Department, Department of Commerce and NASA were successfully hacked. They lost millions of pages of classified information. This country is completely under attack 24-7. And not just our country, everybody's country. And not just governments, but companies and corporations. Just, it's a giant feeding frenzy out there. Here's another question. And uh, this might have an interesting perspective from the various areas that they come from, the various na nations they come from. Uh, what's your nightmare scenario? In other words, the, the event that you fear the most. I live in a world of nightmares. In fact, I'm, I'm, in, in, I'm in charge of the Cyber Defense Agency in France, and uh, I'm paid to imagine nightmares. In addition to the attacks on the nation's telecommunications infrastructure, we are also now receiving alarming reports of significant and growing power outages in major metropolitan areas in the eastern half of the United States. You're going to see planes being grounded now. You're going to see trains not taking uh, to the tracks. People are going to stop moving. Do we have a declared policy in the cyber realm in the same way we had for decades in the, in the realm of nuclear weapons? So I want to answer a question from this morning. Uh, what's your nightmare scenario? My nightmare scenario is that we spend our time thinking about nightmare scenarios. This is important. There's, there's, a, there's a certain blindness that comes to worst case thinking. It leads to bad decisions, it leads to bad system design, and it leads to bad security. And you all know an example of this, airline security in the TSA. That's what you get when you think about nightmare scenarios. That's what you get from worst case decision making. We will take action against that nation state. Now specifically what that is, I don't think you should say publicly, but we have ways to do that. What everybody in this room will be judged on, and trust me, you'll all be judged when this is all over for years to come, is did we carve out every absolute option, every piece of power we had. Cyber war is largely hype. I mean, it's hype by the media because it's, you know, cool and interesting, but it's really hype by the government trying to seize more control. I mean, there's a huge power struggle going on in government right now between the NSA, Homeland Security, and FBI over who gets control over the internet and internet security. And the NSA is winning. And they're winning by pushing this cyber war fear. Right, this fear of cyber armies attacking us. It's largely nonsense, it's largely hype, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny, but it's big and scary. And when people are scared, they're much more willing to give up their liberties, their privacy, their freedoms to someone who'll make them feel safer. Is the public scared? Yes, and that's a good thing. Now the maze is changed again, near its very end. Things go smoothly enough at first, as the mouse proceeds on the basis of information it remembers. Now it's running into trouble. But fortunately, it is able to adapt to this new situation. It resorts once more to trial and error and acquires reliable new information to replace the old. My doomsday scenario is a single EMP bomb above the country, you know. If, if you can build one nuke and you can blow it up two to 500 miles above the country, um, the resulting electromagnetic pulse is enough to basically stop almost all electronics in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And when that happens, uh, you're screwed. You know, there's no fixing that. It would take us back to the 1920s with the resulting population of the 1920s because that's all our infrastructure would be. And I think it's about like 180 million people would die in this country within six months. It's, you know, pretty severe. And that's how dependent we are on technology. Is there anything that East-West or government institutes around the world 
are working with education programs to help close that divide, make it part of the mandatory curriculum to help educate kids on the foundation of technology. So I think that's cut it back. I think uh, the kids need to educate us. I mean, the thing about generation gaps is the younger generation always wins because the older generation dies. And the way the kids are doing it is the correct way. We're doing it wrong, we're doing it old, right? Emails for old people, not for kids. And, and that's the way it's gonna be. So I think better than us educating the younger generation is let them educate us on how they use the net, how they want the net to work, how it fits into their lives so we can build infrastructure that benefits them. Because the education is not gonna go the other way. I mean, the internet's the greatest generation gap since rock and roll. You know, younger people are using these technologies in ways that the older people can't even fathom. Regularly, I get people asking me, what can I do to convince my kids not to do these things on the net? And I tell them, you can't. And more importantly, they're right and you are wrong. But the younger generation gets to decide how technology will be used. I mean, they're gonna build the social systems that will be used in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Because internet's about people, about connecting people, about people being able to find other people of common interest, or being able to communicate with their family or friends in ways that were impossible before. Be able to bring information into communities that didn't have access to it before. To democratize uh, knowledge and information and communication. The value of this information is so great that it's changing the planet. But sometimes there's a problem without a solution. And even a mechanical mouse must have a helping hand. I, I'm not sure if I know how to end this story. Could, uh, where, where, does, no, where does this story end? Or does right, it have an ending? The, the problem with ending is we're still in the middle of it. We are in the middle of the information age revolution. In 50 years, you can do this documentary and you know how it ends. Now in the middle, you know, we can just guess and not even very well. When you're riding the ride, you don't know how it ends. That's just the way it goes. On the plus side, it's kind of a fun ride. This agile three-wheeled little mouse contains a small bar magnet. 100 relays in electrical circuits remember the directions for the mouse. Dr. Shannon's mechanical mouse demonstrates that machines can learn by experience and can revise what they've learned when it no longer works two important characteristics, at least, of intelligent behavior. Our lives are being rapidly changed by the development of large computing machines. A complete computer system weighs 22,000 pounds. When the hero of any science fiction show has a problem, he usually turns to his trusty computer for an answer. Sometimes they think so hard, they get up tight. They blow their cool. Around the world, Economic factors will continue to stimulate the application of computers to new areas. But advancing computer hardware technology is just one part of the story. Over to Ken Jennings now. Bram Stoker is what we're looking for, and we find. Who is Stoker? I, for one, welcome our new computer <laughs> overlord. <laughs> Thank you. Accurately and tirelessly, electronic computers can trace out the consequences of a thousand possible actions, can pick out the best design among thousands of possible designs, thus providing a better base for the informed exercise of human judgment.